chapter 10. We're, we're back to Corinthians. Thank you, worship team, for the wonderful worship selections this morning. It was really great. Thank you, Bob, for the hymn. Uh, you know that's my favorite, and uh, it makes me worship every time. That, and it is well with my soul. <laughs> you know, I can't get past those two hymns without touching God. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I see that my time is limited, so I'm, I think I'm going to skip taking time to read the entire chapter, which I wanted to do, because I'm only doing a chapter at a time, uh, but that will take too long, so um, maybe you can just follow along in your Bible a little bit. I'll make reference to some of the scriptures, what Paul is saying, what he's trying to communicate, and what we can glean from chapter 10 uh, that will help us in our journey through this book. Okay, let's uh, pray and call on God. Father, in the name of Jesus, um, without the Holy Spirit's help, we're just empty clay pots. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to teach us, to open our eyes to spiritual realities, because otherwise we're blind to them. We walk around and stumble in the dark without the Holy Spirit. But with the Holy Spirit, you illuminate us. You make us children of light. You give us insight. You help us to know God. And we grow in trust and faith every time we hear the preached word. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to the authority of the word of God this morning. And ask you, Holy Spirit, to carve into us like a block of marble the image of Christ as we learn from the word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first word in chapter 10 uh, says this, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Paul uses that phrase about four times in the whole book uh, because he's concerned about their stupidity and their ignorance of God's ways. And so he's constantly challenging them to think like Christians and not think like Greeks, which they're surrounded by. The first word of, the, of chapter 10, 1 is the word for, F-O-R. Or if you're from South St. Louis, like my mother, far. For. For is a connecting word, like and. And it connects chapter 10 to chapters 8 and 9. And in chapters 8, 9, and 10, Paul is basically communicating this. We have to be willing to give up personal rights for the sake of the gospel. We have to be really willing to give up personal rights for the sake of the gospel. I can say this with confidence that this is Paul's message because in 1031, which is the end of chapter 10, he says this, I do not seek my own advantage, but the advantage of the many that they might be saved. And so he's training the Corinthian church to not think selfishly like a Greek or a worldly person, but to always be conscious of two things the glory of God, and the benefit of my brother or my sister. In everything I say, in everything I do, and even down to what I eat and what I don't eat. The object is the glory of God and the advancement and the betterment and the encouragement of my brother so that he is not, his conscience is not damaged. Okay. In chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, uh, we have an interesting illustration Paul's using here from the Old Covenant, uh, <clears throat> where he says, uh, our fathers before us passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses. They ate the sp same spiritual food. What, what, what had that been? What was the spiritual food they were eating? Manna. Right? They drank the same spiritual drink. And this drink came from a rock from which water was provided. But what's happening here before you get all spooky and goofy and talk about clouds baptizing and Moses and all the, you know, spurious or some commentators on it, I think they're smoking marijuana or something when they go through this. Paul is only saying. The Old Testament Christians are just like us. They are baptized into Christ 
but he uses Moses as the example. And Christ is present with them, just like he is with us. Now he's using this, the, the, matching them up this way, because he is going to present for the rest of the chapter a warning, basically. They had as much advantage of knowing God that you did, and they failed. So God is using them as an example to us that we won't follow their example. You see that? Because in just a minute, we're going to get to five other things uh, that they did in, their, in the wilderness that uh, caused them to be um, not acceptable in the promised land. All right. So you notice, like, the, the rock following. When I was a young Christian, I could never figure this out. How does a rock follow somebody? I thought maybe the band Rolling Stone got their name from this passage. I didn't know what, you know. How does this work? But it's not a physical rock, folks. Reference to rock is always a reference to God. It's Paul's Christology here. Of saying Christ is God. Christ is the rock. But every Old Testament's reference to God the rock, Deuteronomy 34, we were singing at the end, 32.4, we were singing at the end of our Deuteronomy series. Ascribe greatness to our God the rock. God is not stone. He's not made of granite. But he has the quality of the rock. But this interesting rock gave the people it was following provision, supply, water, things for life. And we just came to a similar table where we eat to be nourished in our journey and strengthened in our union with Christ. That's what we come for. Don't come here just to do a ceremony. Let, release your faith that, God, you are strengthening me. God, you are nourishing me. God, you are making my face glad with my journey. Because that's the journey one. And Christ is present with us. Always in the table. This is not transubstantiation where something magically changes. No. By faith, what we are saying is, God, you are with me. I am going to reframe my mind and, and not get discouraged this week because I needed to be reminded and remember that you are my rock. You are my provider. It's not the state. It's not Social Security. It's God who is your provider. And so that's what's happening there in verses 1 through 5. Okay, we go on then to verse 5. Uh, he says, they had these advantages of knowing God. God and Christ, like you did. But they were overthrown in the wilderness. Fascinating, that word overthrown there. Uh, it's a reference to Numbers 24, where God said, uh, you're not going into the land because of these certain issues we're going to cover in a minute here. And they were left to die in the desert. And the next generation that rose, rose, rose up were the ones who went in. So they all died in the wilderness, majorly because of their unbelief. But they were overthrown, Paul tells us, because they were grumblers and complainers. They did not see, and for that reason, they did not see the promised land. This is Numbers 14, 21. If you're ever confused about what God is doing in your life or in our world. If you're ever confused, go to Numbers 14, 21, or memorize it like I have, and say, this is what God is doing. But as for me, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. You might want to take a break. You might think you've got a bad deal. You might want to remember, but this is what I'm doing. And I am going to see it through, with or without you. That's the promise that God, what is God doing? He's filling the whole earth with his glory. Well, it doesn't look like it. I don't like what's going on. You know what? Hold your peace. What are you? 22 years old? You have all knowledge and all wisdom, and you're going to tell the Almighty who has, has never had to be created or born, who lived forever and ever, eternal God, that you don't like the situation? You know, stand still for a little while. This is why history is so amazingly important. 
What does history reveal to us? Why do we even study it? Oh, they hardly do in school anymore because they hate God. But why do we ever study history? What's the purpose of history? Anybody? Bob? It demonstrates God's sovereignty over all things. It demonstrates God's sovereignty and faithfulness to covenant in all of history. Who ever thought that somebody could ever stand up against Egypt and Pharaoh? They ruled the world. He, th he called himself the son of God, the son of Ra. They had an empire that people were terrified, the Assyrians. And now, no more. They all disappear. They all get trampled down. Read Daniel. <laughs> and the only kingdom that remains is God's. Well, it's taking too long. You know what? Again, you're a blip on the screen of world history. I was talking to a person the other day, and they were wanting me to admit to the rapture because they just want to get out of this thing as fast as they can. And I said, I, the Bible does not teach any kind of escape this way. And uh, they were so upset and so angry. I said, then what am I supposed to do with my life? And I said, be faithful in your generation like David. Have a testimony and a witness for the next generation. I said it might take 10,000 years. They walked away from the breakfast table. I don't want to wait that long. Well, it's not up to you, and it's not even for you. <laughs> All right, I'm getting off. But here we are. Then we go into a series of crime. Of their, their basic crime was, it says in verse 6, if you look at it with me, verse 6. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. These things became a, a, an example to us that we might not desire evil. And then Paul goes into a series of five things, in verse, starting in verse 5, in verse 6 rather. With the, he says this, he uses this phrase, as, were, as some of them were, as some of them were, as some of them were. Verse 6, they desired evil. Some of them were idolaters, verse 7. Verse 8. They engaged in sexual immorality, verse 8. Verse 9, they put Christ to the test. Verse 10, they were grumblers. And in all this, Paul's message, message to them is, don't be like them. Do not fall into the same trap of unbelief that they fell into. Where's the promise of the Lord's coming? I don't see God doing anything. Again, you don't, have you been to Brazil? There's revival going on all over the world all the time. Just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening. Don't be so selfish and self-centered. and Your whole world is locked into you know, one little keyhole of experience. Broaden your experience. You do that by learning history. By reading outside of yourself, anyhow. <clears throat> he warns them of these different things that are happening. And what's on his mind? What's he thinking about here? Uh, when, they, when they desired evil, um, they were idolaters. When were they idolaters? What, what is he thinking of here? He's a great Old Testament scholar. What's on his mind when he's saying they were idolaters? Golden calf incident. Very good, Paul. And they fell into that situation. They engaged in sexual immorality. Anybody? When was that? It, it caused a plague, and my very favorite Bible character was raised up in this story. Anybody? Numbers 25, Phineas. Right in front of Phineas, who was a soldier... A Moabite man and a Hebrew woman went into a tent to fornicate. And it says, Phineas broke rank, stepped out of line. Nobody else moved. No priest. Nobody. To stop this evil. And it was causing a plague in the camp. And Phineas went over and speared them both through, use your imagination. And God rewarded him with a priesthood. 
So I ask this question frequently when I go to conferences and I meet with other pastors because they're all soft and we should be priests. We should be kind to people. We should listen to the LGBT community. We should know their problems. We should enter in and say, what about Phineas? Is the church anything like Phineas? Now, I'm not advocating spearing people, you understand, but standing up for righteousness. The church has been duped into thinking that it's just a caring pastor. I'll take care of you. Let's analyze your life. Let's go through every single thing that's ever happened to you. It's not in the Bible. You think Paul was asking those questions and weeping with who was he in the jail with? Was it Titus? No. Silas? Silas. In jail. Oh my God, I, I tried so hard. What are you doing? It says they celebrated and rejoiced and gave joy to God and praised the Lord. But we sit and analyze what's happening to me? Give it to the Lord. Go find somebody else who has a greater need. And pretty soon your need will pale in comparison. I, I, I like this illustration from my friend. I'm not going to make it through this message, but uh, Larry Tomsak had a, one of the best illustrations of this that I ever heard. I, I stole it from him. He says, you take a, a gorilla, two gorillas out of the wild. And while they're in the wild, they're only concerned with survival, with food, with protecting their family, with fighting off. Uh, predators, whatever it might be, they're consumed with that. But you put them in a zoo, and you put them behind a barricade of some kind, and all day long, all they do is pick fleas off of one another. He says, you're t so my, my point is, we're too interested in ourselves when we're not taking interest in all the things that are going on in the world. Grab a handful of tracks, go talk to some people about the Lord, and compare your situation with theirs. You might think differently about what's happening to you. We're still friends, right? Praise the Lord. You, God's interested in your things, but all he's asking you to do is cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. He didn't say investigate them. What happened to you when you were three? Now pay me $200. What? <laughs> Since when did Christians become psychologists? We have the Bible. We have Jesus with us ever present. And we're called and commanded to cast our cares upon the Lord. Okay, that's done. And we keep going on in the image of Christ and bringing Christ to the world. All right. So they, were, they put Christ to the test. Uh, put, putting, Christ to the putting God to the test means this. See how far they can go to defy God's requirements. I've been in conversations with other church leaders. on basically what sins are acceptable to God that we should be patient with because he's patient. And so the discussion has gone from holiness to what's the minimum we can get away with and keep a man an elder. And I would always co contribute, especially where homosexuality was involved, I would say, Let's save the man and crucify the minister. He cannot represent the church of God in this condition, but we can bring restoration to him. But that's not what he wants. He wants acceptance, inclusion, DEI. Folks, it's getting worse. Be a Phineas. Don't spear anybody but always stand for righteousness, and you'll be doing your duty to the Lord. Uh, I have a quote from you from Martin Luther, and I have to change glasses because I printed it real small, and these aren't helping me anymore. Martin Luther says this about putting God to the test. To put God to the test is when, either out of contempt for him or from unbelief, we dare him, we dare him, are, are indig indignant at having to endure the things the Lord puts us through. There is no more common or deadly plague than to grow angry and grumble on account of our adversities, as if God had forgotten us. 
That's from Martin Luther. We've all passed through these very difficult phases, stages. I've had one, I had one not too long ago, and I was so grateful for God's mercy to long suffer with me. But this kind of thought came to my mind, what am I doing? What am I going to accuse God of? What am I going to question the Almighty on? Job stuff, which I taught from. I know it. And I, I just want to go with repentance and say, I am not in the position to judge you or to tell you what to do or to even question you. And God healed me. So before you're preparing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Almighty, I just want to encourage you, don't. You will lose. And if you insist on sticking with what's happened to you and letting it define your life, then you live a life of misery and God won't help you. But let him heal you. He, truth is the beginning of healing. It's getting it all out. Uh, one more thing on my, this is another one from, uh, help me, not Bob Mumford, what was his name? Bob. Oh, shucks. Mobile, Alabama. Not Bob. Simpson. Charles Simpson. Thank you. Sorry, I was thinking of Bob Mumford. Charles Simpson, uh, he was a Baptist preacher, and he was so embarrassed because he smoked cigarettes. He kept it from the church, always fumigating himself, and, but he smoked like a fiend, apparently. And so he was convicted, you know, and he went to God, and he said, God, please help me. I, I want to be released from these cigarettes. It's just not, it's not a good example. It's not good for, health, for my health. It doesn't glorify you. Um, I just, I want free of this. And God said to him, no, no, you don't. No, no, Lord, I insist. I, I want free of these cigarettes. Please give me your grace. You don't want to be free. Why don't you tell me the truth? Well, Charles said, all right. I love cigarettes. I love tobacco. If I could, I'd put it in a sandwich on my nightstand and eat it in the middle of the night. I'd stuff my cheeks with it every day. I'd sniff it up my nose all night, all day long. I love tobacco. And in that instant, he was healed. <laughs> why, why am I saying this? Just be honest with God. Don't give him flowery prayers. I accept you, Lord, what you're doing. And <laughs> Just be honest with him. If you don't know how to be honest, read the book of Jeremiah. That'll help you. He's my favorite guy. He said a lot of hard things. You, you, you read Jeremiah and you step back and say, Jeremiah, the earth's going to open up and swallow him. You can't say these things to God. But I think God appreciates honesty. And what's really in your heart? And, and Charles said, okay, this is really what's in my heart. Okay, now, now we get it. All right. So I, uh, idolatry, Paul's summary, summarizing this message was, Verse 14, he says, flee from idolatry. All the apostles are big on fleeing from idolatry. You see, the Corinthians took idolatry lightly, not seriously. Idolatry is the attachment or devotion to something other than God. The attachment or devotion to something other than God. You're so devoted to something. It could even be your family. This is what Jesus meant, unless you hate mother and father. Now, he wasn't saying that you burn a cross on your parents' lawn and hate them with human hatred. He was saying, your love and devotion to me is so profound that your love for mother and father looks like hate. And this is the kind of relationship that a jealous God wants to have with his people. Why he warns so severely, constantly through the old, old Testament, flee from idolatry. Don't get attached to something. I got to have this. I got to have this. No, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let's get to that place. And then you'll know maturity. Israel's sins were written for our instruction. 
basically Paul is saying, don't be like them. Don't put confidence in yourself and self-righteousness. It always leads to a fall. Uh, then finally, uh, 10, 14, chapter 10, 14 through 22, uh, never compromise with sin. Basically, Paul is saying, stop attending pagan festivals. You are participating with demons. No, no, I'm free, man. I, it's not hurting me. It's not harming me. I can handle this. No. When you're going into this environment, you are participating with demons. So he says in verses 14 through 22, you are in union with Christ. You're only to participate with Christ. Participating with Christ means saying no to evil. Saying no to uh, the world and its draw and its lure. No, I belong to the kingdom of God. You can't have me. You know, when Paul was exhorting us in the menu, I was, couldn't help th but thinking about baptism. When you pass through the Red Sea, because it was in the teaching here, it's like water baptism to the Hebrews. That's what it was like, right? Water baptism. But notice this. The same water baptism that saved Israel destroyed God's enemies. Do you know how profound your water baptism is? You were stolen from the devil and from the world. That, that makes them really angry. Jeff, that's why we have trials and temptations. They're not willing to let you go. You were their soldier. You were their torchbearer. And now you're not. That really upsets some people. Again, that's why we have the table every week that says this. I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me. I'm crucified to the world and to its passions. I will not go along with evil, ever. As a matter of fact, I'll do everything in my power to expose it. Charles Spurgeon has a quote I wish I'd have brought with me. I'm gonna, I hope I don't butcher it. Help me, Holy Spirit. The quote goes like this. When a Christian comes into union with Christ, he makes a covenant with Jesus to be the enemy of evil. And so there's a flip side to redemption that says, you're God's ambassador now. You're God's soldier. You're God's son. You're the inheritor of all this. Are you going to do something about it? Or are you going to just sit there and just complain about the conditions of the world? Or are you going to go out there and be a testimony that reflects another kingdom? It shouldn't be getting quiet in here. This was supposed to be a happy thing. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Uh, in verse 16, Paul remembers the cup in the Lord's Supper. He doesn't talk about the bread, which is interesting. And I think it's because probably uh, during the ceremonies in the pagan festival, it was about libations, not so much about the food. It was drinking drinks, which was a prime component in pagan rituals. So he says, you have the cup of blessing. Now, the cup, they had five cups in the Hebrew ceremony of Eucharist, of the Lord's Supper, of Passover. The third cup was called the cup of blessing, and that's the one Paul's referring to, the cup of blessing. And, the Paul, and Paul says this, the way Paul prescribes us to flee from idolatry is to never participate in pagan, pagan, cere, pagan temple ceremonies and to only participate in one ceremony, the Lord's Supper. Participating in the Lord's Supper is by faith proclaiming by the way, he, he enlarges this next week in chapter 11 on the whole concept of the Lord's Supper because he is uppermost in his mind. When you take the Lord's Supper, you are by faith proclaiming by baptism, I am united to Christ. Number two, I belong to Jesus exclusively and not to the world. The world has no hold on me anymore. And number three, Jesus is my Savior, my life, my provider, my protector, my Lord. I receive from him alone, and I do not put my trust in anything or anyone else. Isn't it? I mean, you don't have to live very long on this earth to see how God operates, where he shakes everything, constantly shaking, 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 so that we will lose our confidence 
in one structure or one power structure and go run straight to the cross and straight back to God and say, no, it's you. It's you. But he has to do that for us because we're weak and our proclivity is that, oh, maybe the government will help me. Maybe I can get that grant. Maybe I can get these people. That, you know, Jesus is weak. Well, I'm standing right here. Why don't you come to me? I'm the rock. You want water? I'll give you water. Okay. Ooh, I just thought of something. That interesting passage where it says, uh, I can't remember where it is now, but you either fall on the rock or the rock falls on you. That's interesting. Okay. Um, 10.23 to 11.1, one, cl cleaning this up, uh, rounding third. Here we go. A couple guiding principles and we're done. He, starting with 23, he's back to eating food sacrificed to idols. And so some principles come out of this, and this will be the end. Christians have full liberty, but liberty must not be exercised or curtailed to build up the spiritual life of others. Always taking in consideration the glory of God and your brother, your sister, your neighbor in anything that you do. You have full liberty, because this was their argument, Corinthians. Now, I'm free, Paul. It's nice of you to say, anything, but I'm, a fr I'm free now. I'm a Christian. Yeah, okay. But you need to sometimes cur 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 curtail your liberty in certain situations so your brother's not offended. Number two, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Peculiar scripture, verse 31. Here's some questions you can ask yourself, not about just eating or drinking, but about anything. Ready? Will what I'm about to do glorify God? Will what I'm about to say glorify God? Will what I'm about to do inspire or harm my brother in Christ? Those are some good questions to ask ourselves. To have Christian behavior. And then finally, I believe chapter 10, because there are no chapter headings in the Bible, you know that. It's not divided into verses. It's just a letter. But I think 11.1 1 belongs with chapter 10 because he concludes his thoughts by saying this, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so here's what I want to leave you with as a challenge as we close. The goal for all of us is to be able to say with Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. And then here's some questions I'm going to leave you with. Can you and I say this with Brother Paul? Can you say, follow me as I follow Christ? Are you and I putting, putting forth an example of godly living, godly attitude, and God-honoring behavior and lifestyle that we can say, imitate me? Do it like this. That's discipleship. It's not just laying about a bunch of rules. It's by uh, Albert Schweitzer said this, that uh, example is not the only th thing in leadership. Uh, example is not the main thing in leadership. It's the only thing. And so when a minister loses his example for, for the people of God, he's lost his job. It's the only job in the world like that. You can get away with all kinds of things at Boeing. Ask Fred. But in this industry... You lose your example, you lose your standing. And we're called to be salt and light to everybody, even Christians who are sometimes ignorant of what the Word of God says. And so all the time, live a life of discipleship, not correcting people, not adjusting people, not being God's marshal or sheriff, but provoking love and good deeds from your brothers and sisters and saying, have you considered what the Bible says here about that? That act that we're about to agree to in a contract, I'm afraid I can't sign this contract, and here's the reason why. It's going to cost you your job if you don't sign. Well, I, I'm far more interested in giving glory to God than I am in working for your company. So I'm not going to sign this document. And here's why. If you adjust that, you'll, you'll have my signature. I have a lot of friends that have left businesses and big paying jobs on those ethics principles. I have friends in Africa and in Guatemala who have been thrown out of jobs for those very things and reasons. 
uh, our old friend Carlos Velasquez was kicked out of Congress for standing for righteousness. The whole Congress was in on some kind of massive bribe from Norway or something to allow abortion ships to dock uh, because the, the Christian president outlawed abortion. Norway was going to send ships to dock so you can get an abortion. And Carlos says, I am not signing off on this. And they kicked him out of Congress. <laughs> All right. I'm asking the question of myself as well. Can I say with Paul, follow me as I follow Christ? Because if I can't, I need to get with God and get it right. Because that's all I have. You can have all kinds of letters after your name, but if you don't have an example, let's all stand.